what I'm seeing is we're like a bunch of electricians and we're wiring up the world for like Bitcoin, for, for, for a Bitcoin standard or hyper-Bitcoinization. But the power's not really on yet, right? The liquidity is not really there. The, the need isn't always fully there. But like the day the power goes on, like watch out because once we run out of like, you know, we're pressing on the brakes, you know, with our these different like policies that we try and like stamp out the, 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 the crises with, any of these communities, any of these 20, 30, 40 communities around the world that ha- that are like maybe 30% Bitcoinized can go to 100% in like days. Hello, I am Cody Allingham, and this is the Transformation of Value podcast. In this episode, I talk with Andrew Begin, Director of Marketing at Galloy, a company building Bitcoin native banking infrastructure for organizations. We talk about Galloy's Bitcoin projects, including the open source Blink Wallet, made popular through Bitcoin Beach in El Salvador. I learn about the vision for the product, as well as its stable sets, functionality, and how this works. We discuss the power of communities taking ownership of their financial infrastructure and the opportunities for grassroots Bitcoin adoption in Africa and Latin America. Finally, we talk briefly about permaculture and regenerative farming and the connections with Bitcoin thinking. If you have any questions or would like to reach out, my emails are always open, hello at the transformationofvalue.com. If you would like to support the show, please consider leaving a review or boosting some sets via your favorite podcasting 2.0 platform. Otherwise, on to the show. You know, it's funny. I only recently set this up. I used to play a lot of music. I record music and stuff. So I had all the gear, but only maybe six months ago did I finally say, okay, let me set it up. Let me get the proper setup going. And if I showed you what's outside of this little podcast booth, you'd be like, oh man, this is, I'm in a basement. And so <laughs> I've, uh, I've, I've set myself up to have a, a decent, uh, a decent setup. Yeah. Now that's cool. You are, um, you do a bit of music, you say. Yeah. Um, I, back in like 2010 or so, I lived in San Diego. I was learning guitar and I had some friends who were pretty accomplished musicians and would play out and around. And so I, I started, playing with them and then eventually like got addicted to it fell down that rabbit music rabbit hole and uh for three or four years i used to gig out and play bars and you know do cover gigs and original music and stuff and uh so it was a it was it was a great time i don't play that often these days uh with two kids and uh and whatnot and and a startup job but um i recently was in uh El Salvador for adopting Bitcoin and they had the Satoshi Rakamoto there, which you may have seen where they, you know, they get a back line and, 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 uh, anybody who hops up can play. And I, I got to hop on stage and play a couple tunes. So I love, I love music. I've only, I've recently been starting to get back into it and I've, I like to see the, the Bitcoiner scene that, you know, is, is interfacing and crossing paths with music a little bit. You know, DJ Satoshi has a Saturday night Twitter space, which is like an open mic and stuff. And so I'm trying to get my, my music chops back. You might have seen, um, there's a Kiwi girl, Tip, who does the rapping. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, Great so stuff. That's really cool. And have you found like just generally with creative work, like how does that connect with Bitcoin? And I hope we can talk a little bit about what, what you're working on at the moment. But like, have you seen sort of crossover or interesting um connections there yeah of course um it's funny when i speak to somebody and i mean like maybe extended family or like i meet some some somebody who and and they're like oh you work in bitcoin is that ftx or you know and they you know they're very like on the surface you know a lot of times what i'll say is like bitcoin is the most interesting thing that i've come across since i learned music uh, but if there's there are parallels because like music is built on math or you can reduce a bit uh, music to math and, and principles of, of you know, um, physics and things like this. And I think that at the base layer, that is an interesting parallel to Bitcoin, which is that like it has really, really strong sound principles that are make it what uh, powerful um, and uh, are reasons for it being powerful. And um, and then beyond that, I think that uh, I saw somebody like tweeting about this or something today like um bitcoin is probably american hodl but uh, something like you know bitcoin the journey of learning about bitcoin makes you 
kind of question and, and dig a little deeper into everything. Um, and it also, I think, results in you becoming a little bit more genuine version of yourself. Um, because you think, I, I believe that you zoom out a little bit and you think more about, you know, low time preference, long time horizon, um, and, and meaning, um, you know, and so, um, I do think it parallels with creative work really well. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So I'm keen to dive into a little bit about what you're working on at the moment, Andrew. So your work with Galoi, um, Blink, um, these different projects. So like, how would you, it's sort of one of those questions, you know, you, you go and go to a party and you try and introduce what you do. And I know what it's like trying to explain what I do, but let's give it our best shot here. What What is it that you do here, Andrew? And, and what are you working on at the moment? Sure. Um, you know, for me, I'm a non-technical person. I'm not a developer. Um, I've been working at Galloway for about two and a half years. Uh, and one of the few non-technical members of the team. And so uh, what I do is, I mean, I wear many hats, but I think at the core of it, it's really uh, community building. And, 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 and that comes to life in many different ways, but it's like building relationships um, and convening people around the mission, right? Like a lot of times what we say is like, oh, okay, I work... I work uh, on Bitcoin at this company or I work for Bitcoin at this company. And that's how I feel like my job is to s help drive Bitcoin adoption forward. Um, and I'm privileged to be able to do that by working at Galloy, which is a company building open source infrastructure for that allows, uh, you know, organizations to launch Bitcoin applications and products that are, you know, very, you know, highly available, secure, et cetera, et cetera. And I also get to work on, uh, you know, the first thing that was ever built on get the Galloy stack is the Bitcoin. Be it was called the Bitcoin Beach Wallet in 2020, and now it's called Blink. Um, and it is the best wallet for bottom up Bitcoin adoption, you know. Um, and and so um, it's just an amazing I, I just feel so privileged to be able to work like, first of all, with the people I work with at Galloy and Blink, um, but secondarily, you know, the, the people who are building Bitcoin circular economy projects and community projects who have decided that Blink is just an awesome tool for them to use. Uh, I'm in contact with them on a daily daily basis. And so, you know, the many of the projects that you've heard about, like Bitcoin Ikasi or Bitcoin Jungle or Bitcoin Lake or, you know, um, and many of the projects that you may not have heard about or have only heard in passing or may hear about by, you know, next year. Um, and so, yeah, um, that, that's probably yeah. a, you know, a no, medium winded no. version of the answer, uh, but we can go in whichever direction from there. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So I, I tried out blink wallet, um, downloaded it, had, had a go. I, I really liked it. I, I love the integration with the map of uh, Bitcoin merchants and, um, I, I like the approach, the, the way that it's built on this, uh, open source stack and this kind of approach of community building, which you talk about, and that's something that's really close to my heart. You know, looking at sort of the community in New Zealand and different places that I've I've been visiting, tr trying to see how these things emerge. And I think the idea of a wallet that is for a community, there's something, some sort of a sense of ownership there. Um, obviously, anyone can use it, but it's designed with a certain community in mind. I thought that was really powerful. So, talking a little bit more about that, what's the long term vision for the for the Blink Wallet and sort of that community building aspect? Sure. So. A little bit of history. So um, B Blink used to be called the Bitcoin Beach Wallet, and um, it was built in 2020. Um, so Bitcoin Beach, the, the project in El Salvador that many, you know, most Bitcoiners, you know, are very familiar with and, and maybe many have visited. Um, but this project started in 2019, um, and it was born out of an existing program that had been going for 10 years, which was essentially to help... Um, keep kids out of gangs, provide opportunity for locals to learn English, learn computer classes. And, and they decided, okay, let's, let's try to, uh, they received a donation and, and they decided, let's try to um, build a circular economy where people are earning Bitcoin, merchants are accepting Bitcoin, people are spending a Bitcoin. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Nicolas, the founder of Galloway um, and, and, you know, the early team, uh, saw this project and and they were working to build a 
uh, a wallet and, and they said, wow, this would be a perfect place to go to get like real world on the ground insight about what people need when they're using the lightning network, you know, and uh, uh, and so the, the, the Bitcoin Beach Wallet was built on the ground and, and it, it was built for the pers- for the purpose of being a daily like spending wallet, right? It's custodial, as you mentioned, it's built on open source uh, code. Uh, and then there the features that kind of mark blank um, really show the the merchant use cases or the or the the community spending use cases. So you mentioned the map that was really important in the early days, and it still is today. Um, you know, you the communities that are adopting today are like hyperdrive because every, all the ground has been laid. So there's a there's a community project called Berlin uh, in El Salvador, uh, and they have like in less than a year, over a hundred merchants accepting Bitcoin and they have expats living there uh, from all over the world. Um, uh, actually an Aussie, uh, <laughs> uh, or, or was he a New Zealand? I forget well, where he's a, from. There's a Kiwi couple, Nikki and James, who are out in yes. Berlin as well. Yep, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, and many, so many people have flocked there um, and they even said uh, the, the map feature, which we mentioned, once you get like five merchants in a, in a town on the map, you go to the sixth one and you say, hey, like we're looking for places to spend Bitcoin. Here's five places. Would you like to be added to the map? And it's like, yeah, like I want to be there too, right? And that was, so it's a nice tool for the community. Um, and in the early days, it, it was really interesting to see, um, uh, so like static QR codes, because if you're pushing us, if you're selling snow cones or hot dogs on the street, you may not have a good internet connection. And so even in those early days, you know, we had a what would now be LN URL. Before then, I think it was just a encoded URL to open up the the, the Blink wallet. Um, but you'd have a QR code, and so um, all of these use cases were born out of that real world experience. Um, and you know, if you listen to Mike Peterson, you know, one of the one of the founders of Bitcoin Beach Project, he'd you know they talk about how um, you have to if you want somebody to use new technology, you have to make it simpler than what they're doing today right and so if somebody made me a pupusa and i could put a dollar down on the table or 50 cents on the table and walk away that's actually pretty easy and now if i'm asking the merchant to wash their hands take out their phone tap it a bunch of different times to create a lightning invoice yeah that's actually more difficult than accepting cash so having something like that static qr code was something really important in the merchant use case and and on and on and on and and some of the other things that um have made it their way to the app uh, more recently are um, stable sats, uh, which is it, it, it essentially works like a stable coin, but there's no token involved and it's completely lightning interoperable and it's very inexpensive. Uh, it's all sats. Um, we could talk about that if we want to go into it. It uses trading to hold that stable value, but that's really important too, because if you're in Latin America, you're in Africa um, and you're trying to get people to use Bitcoin, um, if they accept fifty dollars one day and they turn around and wake up the next day and it's now forty dollars like they don't have you know expendable cash to be able to deal with the, that short-term volatility so stable sats was key in that use case and all these features i mean essentially the, the blink is built to be a tool for bottom-up bitcoin adoption um and it, and it continues to do so and so we're very um we're listening to the communities and, you know, in the early days it was a, a couple communities and now it's 20, right. And people in Honduras and in various countries in Africa and around the world that are using the wallet in their own ways and providing feedback about what's working or what they need. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, because it's open source, you've seen, um, you know, uh, Bitcoin jungle, which is a community in uh, Costa Rica, they have an app that's, Basically, it's a fork of the Bitcoin Beach Wallet. Um, they forked it in in very early, like late uh, 2021 or early 2022, um, and they built their version. And we would love to see more of that. It's not so easy today. You need to have a pretty, pretty savvy team of uh, you know, or, or a d- developer or two that that really understands um, you know the stack and stuff like that to do it. Um, but in the future, we hope you know there to be many different wallets built on the Galloway stack. So. Yeah, I, I, I want to circle back to stable sats in a moment, but I just coming back to the original connection with El Salvador, and you talk about uh, Nicholas Bertie, the CEO of Galloy. How did that connection originally emerge with Latin America? Did you guys go in and think, hey, we want to build something here alongside 
what's happening in Bitcoin Beach or was there a, a, more of a p personal connection with some of the, the people who are already working on Bitcoin Beach? Like how did, what was that origin story there like? Yeah, so the story goes <clears throat> actually that um, Mike Peterson went on an early Tales from the Crypt uh, and or What Bitcoin Did episode. Um, and I think in one of these episodes, I forget which one, I don't even know if it was called Bitcoin Beach yet. It was like youth programs in El Salvador and Bitcoin, right? And and uh, and there was also a Forbes article. And the specific timeline is 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 miss. I'm I'm, I'm miss, missing it right now in my brain. But some, um, but uh, they learned about the project, um, Bitcoin Beach, and said that's interesting. We have to reach out and actually kind of quote unquote, you know, cold called and said, Hey, we want to, first of all, we just want to learn about what you guys are doing. And then second of all, maybe we can help because we're doing something that is, um, uh, works together, you know, with what you guys are doing. Down yeah. There. I think I've actually read a, maybe like a, a document or sort of outlining that original youth development plan that you mentioned. Cause I, I recall mm -hmm. there being some connection there around just, you know, as the community was trying to move on from a lot of this gang violence and that there was something there. And I, and so that's kind of those two things came together and Bitcoin has played a pivotal role in helping develop that. So um, that's really sure. cool. Um, coming back to stable sats, I did have some questions here. So uh, someone tweeted stable sats, not stable coins. And I think a lot of us maybe feel a bit ambiguous or unsure about what stable coins mean given some of the issues around centralization um some of the issues with things like tether and and other stable coins where people think oh i don't know and obviously there is a use case in latin america for that price stability but what are the risks here is there counterparty risk what what is the the, the machination of stable sats and how does it provide um guarantees or or uh, certainty that it's 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 good to go yeah i mean nothing is guaranteed except for satoshis in your cold storage with keys that only you hold right yeah. um the um you know the tongue-in-cheek you know thing that i said one day was like once you stabilize satoshi some of the magic wears off right and so um but 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 you know to to, to break it down uh, there is counterparty risk right like the way that stable sats is currently running um is essentially a hedging or a trading engine um where you you know, take short positions and hold Bitcoin so that if the price of Bitcoin goes down, you, you're in money in short position and the price of Bitcoin goes up, you hold sats, right? And this is a concept uh, that actually Arthur Hayes of BitMEX has been writing about since 2016. So the, the idea is not new, um, but we were one of the first to execute and put it like into production into people's hands. Um, Right now, the dealer uses OKX, so it is a centralized exchange, um, and um, the uh, you know there, there's uh, essentially with with any sort of stablecoin or any asset that again that is not Sats in cold storage, you're, you're essentially saying okay, there is counterparty risk. Now, what is it, and and you know why would I choose one thing over another? Um, and so with this, it's kind of like without banking integration. And so, you know, um, so, you know, you can have account, uh, you know, an OKX. Um, and one of the ways that it works is that, you know, uh, a trade is not being made by every time a customer of Blink moves $5 into stable sats, but rather there's a engine and a team that is managing, you know, the, uh, the exposure and, and, and the stability of the, uh, on, uh, stable sats and it's an open source project. And so, um, you know, there's a couple things that we're, we've done some work on and are thinking about further. Um, so one of the things is a uh, multi-exchange to reduce risk, right? So right now it's OKX, but you could have run it with OKX and, you know, insert exchange A, B, and C alongside, right, to de-risk that or to de-risk the, um, you know, the impact of, say, an exchange um, having an issue. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then another um, exciting sort of idea for it is uh, using DLC, so discrete log contracts, right, um, which 1010one has an app um, that's doing this. Uh, and we've looked into it as well. And I think that LN Marcus just had an announcement that they're, um, they're, they're going in this direction. So when we launched stable sats about a year and a half ago, um, really we, we, the, the decision to go with OKX was the, um, or one of the deciding factors was the available liquidity, right? Because, um, you're, 
uh, you're, you're, a ba- you're a- able to continue to provide, you know, stable sats as a product, so long as there's liquidity, so long as there's somebody to have, you know, execute the trade. Um, and so the liquidity was there, but um, I'm personally pretty excited about what the people are doing with stable USD, synthetic USD on DLCs and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I think that the other, the other key thing is that, uh, you know, you, as a, as a user, as a company, um, you know, is, is having tools or having options available to you, right? So, you know, some people uh, think, okay, I want to use a stable coin, but okay, stable coins are, you know, you have a token and you're also interfacing with Ethereum, Tron, you know, and, and you know, other networks to be able to use that, uh, right? Um, with stable sats, it's, it is only Satoshi's, right? And so um, there is no banking connection to it. You can't like send it to your bank account and convert my like, synthetic dollars to, you know, to, to physical USD. Rather, you pay it, pay an invoice from your dollar balance and um, it's converted to Satoshi's and Satoshi's get sent out. So it is that um, just incredible like use uh, use case of just to say, I'm a merchant, I'm, se- I'm selling, you know, my product and I don't, I don't want to be, able, don't want to be stomaching the, uh, you know, eight, 10, 30% swings on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Um, I just want to know what's there because I have to buy more product on Friday. And the feedback on it has been like, just amazing because I mean, not everybody, not a ton of people, you know, are, are you, there's people that use it that, that want to use it and, and find a, a huge, like, value in that and then there's people that are like oh i just bitcoin is my stable coin right or whatever like you know one satoshi is one satoshi like i'll insert all of these uh these ideas um but it is uh yeah it's it's an alternative to you know to to using stable coins for sure yeah so sorry just to drill into that a bit more so i've played around with blank um i haven't had a chance to use the stable sets function though so is that how does that work in the sense that are you you sort of store it in the stable set and then you pull it back into Satoshi's when you want to spend or can you actually send send it like you would with a you know a stable coin as we think about it like how does that functionality work yeah so you can um essentially in the wallet you have two accounts you have mm-hmm. a bitcoin account and a stable sats account um and you can set a default you can say when i receive you know, when somebody sends me money, to, you know, I received a stable sats or Bitcoin. You can obviously, you know, change on it on an invoice by invoice basis. Um, but you can receive to your stable sats account. You can also choose to spend from your stable sats account. And so, um, you know, say I went to uh, a Bitcoin, you know, event or a merchant. I went to the butcher. Um, I buy a steak. He's he's using uh, BTC Pay server, or he's using you know, uh, uh, you know, whatever wallet he you know he's using. Um, he's using Phoenix, right? And he creates an invoice for, for, for $20 worth of Satoshis. Um, I can choose to pay that from my StableSats account. Um, and my StableSats balance will get deducted. And the, the trade will happen at that time, right? Because the, the idea is, um, you know, if I move $50 to my StableSats account, um, no matter what the Bitcoin price is doing, that is staying $50 until I spend twenty dollars worth of bitcoin and then that'll be thirty dollars right and whatever that conversion rate is going to happen at the time of uh, purchase yeah. and so you're sent yeah 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 um, I, I see what so, you mean so uh, you're, you're sending you're, you're using the lightning network but it's just that kind of at the end points there's a, exactly. a conversion happening so it's quite different at to rest, so to speak dollars at rest you know and then sats in flight exactly dollars at rest yeah i like that because i think that that clarifies for me just sort of that difference with a stable coin where you're actually relying on some other network to actually make the transaction happen and there's a whole lot of risk there but what you're talking about it's really yeah dollars at rest um i I like it so that's that's a cool functionality and in terms of just sorry one one more thing on that so when people want to use that feature is there any fees or anything associated with that conversion process how does that work yeah so right now there's no fee there's a 0.2 percent spread um on the exchange and so it's i mean (laughs) It's extremely low um, for the for for comparing to you know exchanging you know <laughs> dollars sats. for sats. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 extremely um, reasonable and low. Um, and you know, but but it but it matters. I mean, a lot of the people that are using the wallet are, you know, th- there are many different worlds uh, apart that use Bitcoin, right? And and you know, in many areas of the world, you know, fifteen. 20, 30 sats, I'm, I'm like paying attention to those sats and like, you know, do I want to spend that? When do I want to spend that? And so we're trying at this 
time, you know, it's just, it's supposed to be just easy. We're like, again, we're trying to help drive Bitcoin adoption. And, and so the 0.2% spread is kind of where the, uh, you know, a good um, level is at this point. Yeah, no, that's cool. And look, I, I fully understand, you know, my, my background is, um, you know, design and, and UX and stuff as well. And I, I understand the importance of making that easy to engage with and um, yeah, making it accessible. And I, I'm curious, we're, we're talking about stable sats here as a US dollar base. Has there been any deployments in other currencies? So you, my understanding is that you don't have the liquidity to be running a similar product um, like trading pair wise, uh, to, to do it in other currencies. Um, maybe it's possible to do with like a, a Euro, like a synthetic Euro or something like this, but, but my understanding is that it's not really feasible or, or maybe more reasonable, uh, to, to end up running to, to doing that. So it's not like technically it's, I think it, it's possible. Um, but, but it's just not enough like demand, um, to be using that hedging engine or the, in the same way that you would, um, doing it with the dollar. Um, so, you know, we have display currency in the app, right? And so you can set your display currency to be whatever you want. You can say, I want, I want to see my value in South African Rand. Um, <laughs> I want to see my value in the Nigerian Naira, right? And my, I'm holding synthetic dollars, the dollar balance. Um, and, you know, I believe that if you're holding like a Naira or the Turkish Lira, or you're looking at it in that in that currency, your like, your value is actually going up uh, <laughs> over time because yeah. uh, you're holding the dollars and not your own. Yeah, that's that's interesting because I, I mean, again, from from a New Zealand perspective, I think um, there's been uh, recent talk about a a, a New Zealand stable coin that's come out, which um, is problematic in its own right. Um, just the kind of the corporate background behind that project. But I'm wondering here, um, is this vehicle for stable sets almost a way of getting kind of dollarization in other countries as well because I certainly think you know having having US dollars even in New Zealand is is, is a real positive um, and so presenting the balance say in in a, in a local currency but actually the foundation that is is the US dollar that that there's an interesting kind of game theoretical around um, kind of the the, the spread of US dollar, even say Europe, Australasia, different parts of the world. So it's just, yeah, I thought that was interesting. It's really interesting. And the other thing is like, there's many applications of stable sat, like stable sats, like product, you know, for enterprise usage or otherwise, I mean, we're focusing on a use case, which is, um, you know, a, what a main segment i mean man, there's many different types of users of blink you know all the way up to you know hardcore maxis who just want to have a simple wallet that they can you know uh you know rely upon when they're traveling or something um but a significant user is um either unbanked underbanked um like coming to like bitcoin or the lightning network is their first like in alzante it was their first experience with digital payments Right. And so you're bringing technology to areas that have been left out of the banking system completely. Um, but you're bringing it to them in a way that can swing 20% one way or the other. Right. And, and, uh, and so stable, having stable sets in the wallet, like there's many interesting angles to it, but I think at the core, it's like, okay, bring somebody something that they can <laughs> bring them something they can hold on to, you know, mm -hmm. on a day to day basis, because they've got to make it to Friday and pay their rent with the money that they earned, and they may not have easy on ramps and off ramps. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I mean, again, I, th I think so there is obviously that use case, Latin America, Africa, different parts of the world that really are um, at the ends of, you know, in terms of banking access, there's some real challenges there. But I, I think coming back, though, to even some of these, these, um, these other 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 places such as New Zealand where uh, uh, it, it's an interesting dynamic here you know everyone sort of tends to think New Zealand, New Zealand and Australia are, you know somehow there's one big country but you know we are a separate country but the real big challenge is that our banking system is primarily Australian owned um, thanks to some some things that happened in the 1980s and so all of New Zealand's major banks including the banks that the government uses in New Zealand are Australian owned and so there's actually a real lack of innovation happening and a lot of people notice when they visit New Zealand and think man what's going on the, you know these banks the kind of the systems the technology is actually really behind and um, we've seen a surge recently in things like Wise uh, and Revolut have become very popular as kind of neo banks because they're just cutting edge technology compared to what's available from your 
your high street banks in New Zealand. And so I wonder here, you know, in terms of, again, their access to US dollar stable sets, um, the kind of the ease of use. I mean, do you do you follow or look at what's happening with some of these neo banks and sort of the way they handle stuff on the fiat side as kind of an indicator of what consumers are after maybe in slightly more developed countries? Like, do, how do you see that that all working? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that there's enough. So we're. Uh, we, I'll say, is like Galloway and Blink, right? So Galloway uh, is, um, you know, between Galloway and Blink, we have like 20 people, um, m m many of which are developers. Um, and we have, you know, a to-do list, you know, yeah. that, 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 that could go all the way out the room. Um, and so we're kind of focused really at the core on the, um, the, the, essentially the, 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 the bottom up adoption, uh, in communities that are trying to like improve their, uh, imp improve their community through Bitcoin and have found Bl Bitcoin as well as blink to be a tool to do so. Um, and so while we, we have users all over the world and we listen to, you know, listening to everybody and, and everything else, um, that's kind of the, you know, at least the, we, you know, the, where, where my mind is, is, you know, pretty, pretty focused because we see a lot of growth and a lot of excitement and a lot of um, progress. Um, you know, one community or one project that I, that I didn't mention was uh, run by a, 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 actually an NGO um, called Motive in Peru. Um, <clears throat> and they're, Again, they're connecting people in the uh, the Peruvian Andes who, yeah, I mean, it's these villages. Joe Nakamoto went there, and he's you know he's he uh, did a, did a documentary, and uh, and uh, yeah, there's been a couple folks going down there to do some filming, um, and they're using Blink, you know, very heavily. And so, um, you know, I, I kind of keep one when I you know focused on or, or listening to to what the sort of um, you know quote unquote, first world or, you know, developed nations. And, and but honestly, like, um, you know, being somebody who's from the States, like, I, I want to go where people get Bitcoin immediately and, and where that where it's needed. It's like, it's very, I think, satisfying uh, to, you know, you go to Namibia or, 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 or Uganda or something like this. And people are like, I, I get it. We're going, you know, it's not like, Oh, how are you better than the, the FinTech app that I'm using? Right. Which is, I think what I face with like friends and, and people in the States is like, Oh, yeah. we, ha we have, you know, we have this. And, and you mentioned in, in New Zealand, there's, there's some, mm, a little bit of, uh, I don't know if the techn technological debt is not the right word, but you know, a little left behind in terms of banking. Yeah. Um, so from a UX perspective, I, you know, I, I kind of keep an eye on the, uh, you know, the, the, the fintech space but yeah. yeah i'm focused we're we're focused a little bit more on the uh yeah the sort of the latin america african markets yeah oh no that, that, that's cool and I, I guess the reason i bring that up um you know just uh yesterday we was celebrating I don't, I don't know if celebrating is the right word for it but we have have a public holiday called waitangi day in new zealand which is one you know think of it as the foundational um document of new zealand signed in 1840 between the maori and the and the, the british and that sort of outlined this um this relationship that led to the formation of new zealand and it's a great time to reflect on sort of the role of the sovereignty of the maori people in new zealand um, and sort of the way that all works and it, it really um one of the interesting aspects of that is sort of the way that um, the reserve bank of new zealand the central bank has effectively got a well it has a monopoly on 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 banking and then you've got these commercial banks which are australian owned so they're offshore and um, something I've talked about a lot on this show is the real opportunity for the Maori people and the tribes um, who are, you know, they're very uh, they're developed, you know, that we all, we're all integrated and we, we live together and we're in cities and communities, but there is still a, a tribal identity. And so I'm, I'm very interested in things like um, Blink, uh, things like Fetty as well, just the opportunities that that presents uh, to empower the Maori people of New Zealand who are in many cases, you know, they're, they're running forestry, they're running farms, they're running small communities, circular economies, but they're within, they're situated, situated within a, you know, a relatively developed country. And so uh, it's not spoken about hugely in the Bitcoin space, but I certainly see some connections there. And I'm really passionate. And if there's certainly a few friends of mine who are Bitcoiners in New Zealand who see opportunities there because um, that kind of role of the banking system of, of the state 
in the in the lives of these tribes, which is not really what they signed up for with the Treaty of Waitangi. It's sort of there's certainly a conversation there that I'm interested in exploring. Interesting, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, there was um, there's a guy Jehudi Castro. Uh, he was like an advisor to the president of Colombia, I think, at some point or in some position like this. And I remember he was in an interview. He was interviewed on TV. I think this was not long after El Salvador made Bitcoin legal tender, and he, and he said something to the effect of, uh, you know, people were like, well, why is it? What's the benefit here? And and he was like, well, the benefit is for the people, right? And so if we focus on on the benefit of the people, like the banks can either reinvent themselves or we will reinvent it, banking for them or something like this. And I just like, I love that that perspective because if you like, if you're building, if you have a tool that you that you know can improve um you know the the lives of of people um and you're building that like you know i i i do believe that um you know as as much as elizabeth warren tries to tries to uh pretend like it's it's not happening like i believe that good people will 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 continue to come on board and learn like you know what like this there's actually a, a world changing technology here that um is actually better to um, to think about the uh, um, the benefits of it uh, than to try and fight against it, and so um, you know it's 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 really cool to be working on, and, and that, I, I would love to dig into the story about the Maori uh, 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 people as well because you see that um, in you know the, the Peru is an example in Guatemala. There's you know in, in many areas of the world um, where people have been, yeah displaced or otherwise, um, you know, put onto the, some of the fringes, um, you know, there's a, in Kenya, there's a sort of a, I don't know if slum is the, is the right word. Um, there's, there's a, you know, called the Kibera. And I know that, you know, some of my friends over there are, are going in there and teaching Bitcoin and, and bringing access. And it's like, man, I mean, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, but the yeah. fact that all you need is a, you don't even need a smartphone anymore. We used to say all you need is a smartphone and now all you need is a, a Nokia, like, you know, 8610 or whatever, and you can use Machinkura to send sats. And it's just like, it's so cool. Yeah. Well, those things are indestructible as well. So um, it's quite cool. <laughs> yeah, but right. yeah, I, I mean, again, though, for me, it comes back to community, Andrew. And I think that, that, I mean, this is longer term stuff, but, you know, like what what if, you know, we're sort of going for a hypothetical here, but what what, what does a, a Maori um, Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin wallet look like that they can use in their circular circular economy? They can use... And it's interoperable with, with with other other wallets. You know, uh, I, I see that kind of ownership and that kind of branding aspect being really important because there's necess- there's necessarily something quite colonial and oppressive about using an Australian owned bank in New Zealand because we don't have our own that are any good. Um, there's something very oppressive about having to use um, something like Wise because all of the banks in New Zealand don't have the features that you expect from a, a modern banking infrastructure. Um, and look, I mean, it functions, it, it's stable. It's not, I'm not trying to paint it like it's an unstable system. It's just things take a long time to arrive on the island. Let me put it that way. And so um, an opportunity to work with that. And so I'm curious to just talk a bit more coming back to Blink. Um, and you say, you know, obviously it's open source. Um, it takes a little bit of work to get that stack stood up and, and working. But in terms of that process like what does that look like is that something the lawyer is able to support like how do, how does a community take uh, that code base and deploy it for themselves yeah um so today um you either need it the, the team or or funding right so galloy um you know part of the sort of revenue model for galloy is to provide services to companies that want to build on the galloy stack right that is natu- that's a natural um, you know service but um, but you know if you're if you're launching a community sort of a bottom up grassroots community project um, you're not exactly you know in most cases um, going to be saying well first first things first let's like <laughs> let's spend a ton <laughs> let's spend a, a, a bunch of money to get you know a, a wallet stood up especially with the um, you know, many of the communities, like I mentioned, that like if your community has been on the fringe or left out in some way of the banking system, you know, the first thing you're not going to do is spend a bunch of money on software, like implementing software or building, you know, your own um, on your own stack. Um, in the future, um, I hope that that becomes pretty pretty straightforward for like a community to do. 
Um, there are multiple people who have and or are doing it um, on their own, which is awesome. Um, so Bitcoin Jungle was an example. They forked the Bitcoin Beach wallet in less than three weeks. Uh, they had it ready to go in the App Store. Um, so they made a couple changes and now they're still building on it. And I mean, the beauty of open source software. So Lee from Bitcoin Jungle and now they're working with Francis Puyo from Bull Bitcoin, implementing like on ramp and off ramp in country. Um, you know, that you probably have saw there's a there's a section called earn where you can learn about Bitcoin and earn some Satoshis in the app. Um, we it started out as four chapters and now there's like 20 chapters. We added a bunch of content. Um, but Lee was the one that actually built it into the app and then raised the PR so that we could get it upstream into the Blink wallet. And so we have people who are building on the Galloy stack, contributing back to the wallet, making the wallet better. Um, and so you have Dread, uh, Pole Vault Dream. Um, you know, he also has a podcast called One Love Bitcoin. Um, he's building an app using uh, using the Galloy stack as well. And you have a couple other apps <clears throat> that are that are launching. So. It's, I think it's still a little bit early and it's still a little bit like um, if you think about you're in like UI and design and stuff, if you think about like WordPress it, or like the web development tools like, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, like you could do it, but like it wasn't what it is today. You didn't have your square spaces of the world. That you're, or if you think about cloud computing, you know, push button, AWS, you know, just getting like servers up and running with like a couple clicks, like this is possible, um, you know, down the, down the road, it's not where you are today. You need to have, um, you need to have some, uh, development skills, uh, in, in the languages that the, that, that the repos are written in. Um, and so in the short term, um, I think it's, it's, you know, enterprise organizations that say, are starting to be like, okay, there's bull markets coming back. Like, are we going to do something about a Bitcoin, you know? You got 13 ETFs in the U.S. and and people, you know, you have a lot of interest coming into Bitcoin, um, and you, and you know, you have a. I use an example like, you know, pick your example. The other day, I was using like Home Depot or something like this, like you know, or Starbucks or something. You know, like any of these organizations, like the stack that we're building is um, to the standard of you know what these you know Fortune 500 organizations I think you know would expect of like continuous integration and continuous delivery and like highly available and scalable. And, um, the, yeah, the dev team at, at Galloway is extremely uh, impressive. I'm excited about some of the things that we're working on that we'll be talking about and kind of sharing more broadly later in the year. It's funny working at a company building open source cause you build in the open, like the, you know, nothing's a secret if you, if you want to go find yeah. it out, but we have, we have some cool, um, you know, parts of the stack that'll be kind of coming together and, and, you know, sharing a little later in the year. Yeah, that's exciting. Are you guys uh, working with Liquid at all? Is that something that's on your roadmap or in your? We're not working with Liquid today. Um, I we don't also don't have it on any sort of roadmap um, to speak of. Uh, I find it. I find it. I'm I'm very interested, and I'm like watching. Um, and I guess the way I'm seeing it is that um, I kind of mentioned this before, but like. I, the Bitcoin adoption toolbox is is large, right? Um, and you have Zeus, Phoenix, Breeze, uh, you know, Blixt, uh, uh, Aqua now, which you know with Liquid is is you know a very neat option, um, and, you know, uh, and 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 you know a, a number of others. And uh, uh, Blink, I think, is kind of really meeting um, a, a use case and in a powerful tool. Um, I'm watching what. Uh, the rollout with Aqua, you know, who yeah. starts to gravitate towards it and how it tends to be, to be useful. Um, so Blink is a custodial wallet, right? And so, um, you know, I don't believe that custodial is a bad term as long, especially, or as long as you're, you're clear about that. And as a custodian, you should be promoting self-custody as well. So we've been doing more like promotion around, like, make sure you learn about self-custody, make sure you, you know, and, and, and there's even, there's more features that you can build in to say like, auto withdrawals or like, Hey, like, did you, did, have you learned about self custody yet? Yeah. Education and stuff. And, um, and so we are, we are a custodial wallet. I think there are many tools in the toolbox that are kind of like trying to carve out this place of like, is it custodial or is it not? Is it semi, is it, is it, you know, and, and, you know, uh, I think anything that you're not 
in full control, anything with the counterparty risk is, you know, is arguably not custodial or, or, or arguably not self-custodial. And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, and, and there's a spectrum and I think people are understanding that, but, um, so I, but, uh, but, but as it comes to liquid, I'm literally, I'm just like an observer right now. I'm just kind of like, I'm, I'm dabbling a little bit and I'm just watching to see how people interface with it. And yeah, uh, and, and no, absolutely. I mean, I've been playing around with Aqua as well. And I think uh, you, you're absolutely right. It's, it's a tool set. And what we're really seeing is an unbundling of what's possible because as it currently stands, and this is the problem with the legacy system, uh, it, you know, even in New Zealand is even if we want better features, um, we want, something like WISE, but within, you know, normal banks in New Zealand, it's simply not possible. But what's really great is, you know, in Bitcoin, we can build this stuff and we can have self-custodial options for people. We can have custodial options. There's, there's you know, you, you pick your flavor. And that's really kind of the innovation here. And so I think you're absolutely right. Each community can choose what it wants to use. And the, the fact that they're all interoperable is, is really the great thing. Um, and it, it really can enable that bottom-up ad- adoption as well, because, you know, not having to have any infrastructure or anything that you can just run it on your on your your feature phone or your your smartphone and get up and running. That that's really powerful for bootstrapping it in communities. And then there's other things you can do once people are more established. But absolutely, the toolbox approach, the spectrum of options, uh, optionality is really important. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> got a friend in Namibia, Oaken, who I I always reference because over here in Bitcoin Bitcoin Twitter, we're always like, you know. We're always, you know, brawling about, oh, d- that that's not Bitcoin. You know, you spent from a custodial wallet. And, and he has a slide in his presentation that says, uh, download both Bitcoin apps. And it has a QR for Blink and a QR for Blue Wallet. And he explains in his sessions when he's teaching complete normies who've never barely heard of, you know, know what Bitcoin is. Hey, there are different types of wallets and you should learn about different types of wallets and when when each is, is most useful. Yeah. Um, that's kind of where I where I sit is like I'm I love to see uh, what you know Zeus and uh, you know Greenlight uh, Christian Decker and 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 Br- with Breeze and the, and everything what they're doing and and uh, and I have high respect for because and and they'll even say it it's like we're fighting an unwinnable battle against custodial UX right like the, you know against and but nevertheless they persist and you're getting lightning addresses you're getting these things these these things that previously were only available in custodial in us in a self mostly self custodial or, or or very more frictionless way um so i believe that the gap it's it's the gap is closing and that uh the self custodial lightning wallets are getting better and better and better and better in terms of like the ux and the things that you can do that people want to do with with payments on the lightning um, and then I do believe that it's up to custodial wallets to be open source, to um, to push self custody or to teach about self custody. We've even had um, explorations. We have some designs. We've talked to Seed Signer about having you know a self like a vault, you know, watch only type integration in Blink. And so like I, I think it's that is one thing where like I do believe that we should continue to close the gap so that it's not like. You know, either or. It's just like, man, you have this toolkit, and as you as you evolve in your journey, you can just like customize the the apps that work for you for the different use cases for sure. Yeah, I love it. Um, just zooming out a little bit, then um, come back to some of your travels and your work with customer engagement, with marketing, with kind of education and, and all of that. Um, you, you spent some time in El Salvador, other parts of the world. I'm just really interested in terms of like how Bitcoin has been received. You talk about the way people just kind of get it. And that's certainly not the experience in a lot of other places. But like, tell me just a little bit more about that. Like, any notable sort of moments that stand out to you when you see that the kind of the lights go on in people's eyes as they understand what Bitcoin could mean for them? Yeah, I mean, for people that are living in places where their money is being devalued, I think the most important thing is to like use a Gladstein quote, like check your financial privilege, right? Or like, just, just imagine the world that I don't know what world you live in, but let's talk about the world I live in. Like I've had jobs, each job has some 401k and like, I'm literally just by going to work, I'm like saving money for retirement. Like I didn't even like, it's like part of the law that you just have to like (laughs) be made to save for retirement. Right. And, and when some new asset comes along like Bitcoin or some shit coin, you're like, oh, should I not invest in this thing and invest in this thing instead? Because, 
and and like the the financial connectivity and 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 the same thing goes with like oh this is amazing i can send money from me to you in seconds you know with no intermediary and be like yeah well i have venmo and i have paypal and i have we just have this like this just, just glut of of financial optionality for what we do um and you go to a place like or you know el salvador one of the things that just shook me to the core um in the early days uh my early days of learning about what happened. I wasn't there in the, 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 the beginning, um, but was, was, you know, Mike Peterson saying, you know, there's a, there's somebody, you know, they, they'd buy some extra cinder blocks if they had some extra cash because they know that the price of cinder blocks only goes up. They, they know what the, the, the feeling of, of, of your money being devalued. And maybe I want to be adding a room onto my dwelling. Um, and so I'm going to, I'm literally saving the asset that I save in is cinder blocks. Right. Um, and so, you know, when I think about people who are getting it, it's like, um, it, it is magic to say, oh, I can send money from me to you and, and, and that's, that's it. Right. Like I, I can, I, and, and not to mention like the thing that I think is key is you have a, this idea of a circular economy where, um, we can interact together and send digital payments and hold, um, but the way that you interact with other services or even more importantly other people in the world i think is like changing the shape of the world it's almost kind of bringing to to life like the sovereign individual thesis right because um now you have a woman in brazil who's teaching portuguese to a kid in new york city right and the kid in new york city or the kid's parents are paying a third of what they would finding some local Portuguese teacher. They're getting, the kid's getting a better education, arguably a better education from somebody who literally lives in a, in a village in, in, uh, in Jerica Quara in, in, in Brazil. Um, the woman, the teacher is making double or three times maybe what she would be making doing some other thing, right, in, in her community. Um, and so not only is she able to interact with her community and make digital payments um, to hold Bitcoin and store value in something that that is not melting away from her, but now she can interact with the world and and uh, you know communicate in the single language that like you know the president of a country and a, you know a beggar on the street have you know the same rights to, and so I think that people for when you have the right teacher for lack of a better thing somebody who who like I think that um, they're very effective at be at, at at getting people on board and this is we've seen this with you know, country after country, Uganda and, and these people who are just saying like, man, like they're really getting people excited about this um, and building communities like the town of Ber Berlin, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, Nikki and James, like the entire community of Berlin is a 25,000 person, like it's a city. It's like, it's, it's not a small village. Um, and many, they brought like a bus of like 30 people to adopting Bitcoin conference, all these like b newbies. And there's a lot of engagement and excitement because the community thing says, wait a minute, can we use this thing and store our value in, in Bitcoin? And, but we can actually grow tourism and connect. Yeah. With this, you know, this world, you know, of Bitcoiners. And so they're very excited about it and they're actually going to have a, a, having some, some events around the having, which I think are just going to be amazing. I think that, it's it's almost a year since that project started and it's been um you know it, it's been really something else and so um and the other thing is is um you know like a stable sats or something like this too it's like um if you don't have the the issue right if if you're like stable sats like bitcoin is my stable set is my stable coin like you know i only buy to, if i can hold for four years like right there's just very different world views and so when you go when you go or you hear stories to, to these different places um there's just so much potential and hope and opportunity opened up via the idea of enabling digital payments or the idea of being able to have not just the best asset in the world ever but any asset at all right like because these folks are not buying homes. They're not buying stocks. They're not buying, right? Like there, there, there are no other assets. And so I think that um, it's, it's very, I, I think that they haven't um, learned the, uh, 
to quote D plus plus the other day, the financial fuckery of the entire like financial system that we live in, um, where we, we, and I'll speak of my, myself, I have to unlearn a lot to, to get Bitcoin or I had to unlearn a lot to, to get Bitcoin. Um, and I think that a lot of the people that never really were welcome into the, the global banking system, they don't have to unlearn that. They just kind of, they get, they get what scarcity means, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's almost like the way a lot of places just jumped over the personal computer and went straight to smartphones. Um, and that sort of rollout was, was a lot smoother. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot more portable and, and easy to get your hands on. Um, but that's exciting. So that would you, what you just described that it's uh, quite, quite a, uh, quite a beautiful vision for the world. Is that how you see hyper-Bitcoinization? Is that how Galois sees hyper-Bitcoinization, this kind of universal currency, this kind of removing of barriers and this connectivity? Or I see, yeah, I mean, man, hyper-Bitcoinization, right? What, is it, um, what does it mean for you? I think, I guess when I think about hyper-Bitcoinization, I think about sort of, the end of the journey or this some like larger inflection point. But what's really exciting for me is the, the in between, um, now and then, because what's happening is, um, the, the, the people who've been left out, who get, who, 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 who can get Bitcoin just by literally hearing about it in a meetup and go like, that's amazing. Like, why wouldn't I learn more about this are, are all like, learning and and just so so there's a project a project called bitcoin data um it's a based out of kenya but they do bitcoin education like centered around the around women um they started their sixth cohort i think like today and i think they had like a hundred something students and i was like this again only a year old like the all of these things are just blowing up and meanwhile you have like these curmudgeon, you know, people, you know, in, in the States or wherever else. And they're like, I don't know about this. Is it going up? Is it going up? It's dead. It's failed. It's... And so meanwhile, like these people are just, just munching up sats, you know, a couple sats at a time, you know what I mean? And, and, and so um, I think two things, like back to the idea of hyper Bitcoinization. One, um, number of people go up is like the thing that I get really excited about is like, I, I just get really get excited about more people learning about Bitcoin. Like I don't really care about governments as much adopting it or ETFs and stuff. It's all fun. And like, but um, to, to look at and speculate, but I just really like to see um, the slow trickle of like people learning about Bitcoin. Um, and also um, I, uh, I don't, I don't know when, like our, 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 the financial system is headed for collision, right? Like one of the books that I tell people to read, if they're like, if they're, uh, they're like, what should I, you know, I'm like, first read Price of Tomorrow um, by Jeff Booth. It is not a Bitcoin book. It doesn't mention Bitcoin until like the last page. Um, but if you agree with his thesis, which is that something must break because the system, the way the system designed is not sustainable, then you will find Bitcoin as the answer. Um, and a thought experiment that I can't help but play out is that um, say we go through a massive banking crisis a la 2008 or, or, or Great Depression or otherwise, there's no place in the world I would rather be than in Kampala, Uganda, or in uh, Mossel Bay, South Africa, because what I'm seeing is we're like a bunch of electricians and we're wiring up the world for like Bitcoin for, for, for a Bitcoin standard or hyper Bitcoinization, but the power's not really on yet, right? The liquidity is not really there. The, the need isn't always fully there, but like the day the power goes on, like, yeah, exactly. Like watch out because if the, if heaven forbid another Silicon Valley bank or Silvergate bank, like this thing happens and like, we don't, once we run out of like, you know, we're pressing on the brakes, you know, with our these different like policies that we try and like stamp out the the, the, the crises with um, uh, any of these communities, any of these 20, 30, 40 communities around the world that ha that are like maybe 30 percent Bitcoinized can go to 100 percent in like days. They can just be like, oh, hey, everybody download this wallet and like accept Bitcoin, like, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I may be over overstating it a bit, but I, I really do think that um, like the the places and the people that are adopting Bitcoin today will be in a 
really, really good position in the next, you know, number of years. And like, and, and so like, there's nowhere, there's nowhere I'd rather be, uh, than working with those people and helping them build their knowledge and, and, you know, their, their education. Yeah. Thank you. I love it. That's a story of uh, the, the resilience that can come from these kind of, um, these kinds of places. And, uh, it's, uh, an interesting vision turning the power on and seeing what happens, because I think we have almost gotten used to this kind of crabbing along and just sort of things are happening. But I certainly say to a lot of people, there's so much building that's happened in the last two, three, four, five years that's starting to come online and couple of that with different you know, macro things that are happening. It really feels like, you know, we're, we're building the lifeboats, we're building the technology uh, to make it all happen and, and be ready for, for it when the time comes. One final question what for a, you. And, oh, sorry. And, and what, and, sorry, I was just going to say, and what a privilege. You know, we, everybody wants, you know, you know, just going to the memes, number go up, going crazy. You know, it's fun times, bull market, but like what a what a privilege to be able to just have this crab time. Um, like, you know, there's more and more and more and more people to get downloading blank. There's more and more. I see, you know, every exchange is like, we blew away. We're blowing away our old numbers. Like the, the people are here. The price is kind of just waffling here and there. And that's fine. Like, that's fine. Because like, yeah, like, like you said, like, you know, we, we have, uh, we have this time and when the power goes on, it's better to have more people uh, involved. But go ahead. I, I can yeah, 1.21 gigawatts. Um, you Just one final thing for you, Andrew. Um, you also talk about, you do a bit of woodworking. Um, I just wanted to maybe close on that and talk about sort of the craft and, and what that means for you. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I was, oh, so yesterday I was fixing my wife's KitchenAid mixer, right? Um and I take it apart and I'd never done this before, but I'm like, you know, and she bought it secondhand. Like, you know, we're Bitcoin. We don't spend any money. Like we're, <laughs> we're not interested in new things or consumerism or whatever. We're, um, but I'm, I'm working on this thing and I'm like, man, this is, first of all, it's a little fun. There's a bunch of gears and one of them is made out of plastic, which helps it fail well. Right. Um, and so you get a $5 new gear and essentially I'm thinking like, I'm, this is kind of like playing with Legos um, and uh, and I'll come back to the story. But like the point was like, man, you grow up and you're handed kits of Legos and you're like, I'm going to just build stuff for life. And then next thing you realize, you're just staring at a screen like all the time for your whole life. And you're like, well, man, I was sold a bill of goods. Like I want to like, so for me, like I I need like real world contact with like making things. And so um Woodworking is a thing I like to do of any type, whether it's, you know, we've made a bed, I've made some shelves for my wife and, and um, made some different little products. One thing, I don't know if I have it here, it's over there, but, um, you know, I make little like phone holders or whatever. I like to tinker. Um, and, and so I do that with, uh, with wood, but also we're doing a lot of renovations in our house and we're doing those ourselves. So making trim. And so this is just like what I do to get away from a screen. I'm, I'm still usually listening to like a Bitcoin pod or something like that. But, um, but, but I, but I would say like, it's interesting because learning about B Bitcoin, um, many of the principles or the things that I, like I already held uh, matched well to some of the, like, you know, like the Bitcoin thinking of like, despite having a career in marketing and advertising, I was like, never one to being like consumer, like just buying Like, I just don't like to just buy things. <laughs> like my cars are 20 years old. My, you know, I like, I like old things that can be fixed simply. You know, I, I hate this planned obsolescence. This actually, this shelf I built for my wife, um, we found this chestnut wood, which was from a, like an 1800s farmhouse. And we paid less for that wood than what you would get like this garbage at the store for like the same amount of wood today, you could get this like new cheap wood. And I'm like, why is this just why, like, why is it like this? Like what? And, and to me, it's, I mean, you know why it's like this because the fiat yeah. standard and, and everything is, everything is broken and built on this, this unsustainable growth. And so, um, we actually am working, I'm working on, um, we have a little bit of a property. I'm trying to grow some, um, trying to get into sort of like the permaculture, um, regenerative agriculture. And like, you know, you talk about hyper Bitcoinization, like 
you know, in the future, hyper Bitcoinization, like I want to be out building things. I want to be working in dirt. I want to be building community, you know, in real life, shaking hands with people. And so, um, yeah, wood is working with wood is, um, uh, I mean, it's beyond therapeutic. It's very like, I think it's, um, it's engaging for the mind. Um, yeah. I never realized until I started building things, how bad like nails and like metal and wood are like very weak. Right. But if you build a strong joint, like that, 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 you know, really, um, uses the properties of wood that are, that, it, that it, the strength, um, it's just, it's just, there's nothing better and super satisfying. So. Yeah. Well, just, sorry, just one more thing. Pulling on that, yeah. um, you talked about permaculture, and I'm actually currently in Japan, um, and we've got a lot of friends here involved in permaculture, which is sort of interesting because you think it's kind of a very urbanized place. But um, I'm hopefully going to give a presentation on how Bitcoin and permaculture kind of connect because there's so many connections. And I think that's a whole market there as well because those people get it. And I mean, you, you, you know what I'm talking about, like, um, the ability to create systems, you know, locally sourced food, um, you know, the ability to maybe even put some Bitcoin miners into a into a, a greenhouse and have solar panels and all of that stuff. It's kind of more broadly like this kind of solar punk vision of how we can use technology to empower us instead of enslave us. And so I think that's another kind of a bit of a sleeper because there's a huge amount of people out there, um, possibly more than there are bit, more than there are Bitcoiners who are very interested in you know, sustainability, permaculture, these kind of ideas. A hundred percent. I mean, so I, every Sunday, uh, there's a guy who goes by Jimmy who has a Twitter space uh, called Citadel Sunday, and he's building a ranch in Mexico um, and with permaculture. And somebody reached out to him recently and started helping him to figure out the design where he'd been kind of winging it. Um, and, and this person with years, 20, 30 years of experience started helping um, and he goes, you got to reach out to Andrew. And so this guy reached out to me and my mind has been absolutely blown. It's only been a past week or so, um, with this new information, I've been reading books and stuff, but, um, and one concept I would, you know, build on what you were talking about is he's just like, let's just get down to the inputs and outputs. Yeah. And, and I'm just like, oh my God. And like inputs being like, uh, water or like, you know, lumber and outputs being sawdust or, noise right or something like this and you're like, <laughs> and you're thinking about um like you said with bitcoin miners like and the idea of bitcoin mining uh seeking out you know cheap energy right is like bitcoin miners being a a consumer right of um uh, you know to t to get to get your full potential um out of out of electricity generation and stuff and i think that uh something about this per permaculture space i would agree with you is just like it's so aligned um, oh, to yeah. just being efficient with your time and energy um, because part of it is also like don't kill everything and then plant stuff and inject a bunch of chemicals and then do it again next year. Like build a system that yeah. lasts and it's just, yeah. Yeah. And, and if you look at the origins of permaculture, you know, in modern times, uh, looking at um, Bill Mollison, who, who wrote the book a bit effectively, an Australian guy who sort of, you know, outlined how you can do it how you can make use of natural natural landscape rainfall runoff all of this stuff um it, it really you just there's another chapter in there about how you put bitcoin in there and um it's 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 happening so i think I, I, maybe um, that could be a future episode to look at but i think the connections between permaculture and bitcoin are very strong and i look forward to giving this um, presentation in japan to, to a couple of these friends because it's sort of mu much more than bitcoin acceptance here that i've seen is this idea of like permaculture going back to the land kind of building small communities getting out of the cities these kinds of decentralizing ideas um it's certainly an idea worth exploring 100 percent. it's a uh, by the was it i mean maybe you may know the book uh, one straw revolution was is you know one of the books that i think are a must read and i think it was a guy if i'm not mistaken uh in japan who yeah, yeah, yeah. Started, Fukuoka Mas Masanobu, yeah, one strong Yeah, revolution. yeah, yeah, yep, this guy. Yep. And and he's like, he just started planting rice and barley at the same time, and the barley would grow, and it would protect the rice seeds, and he'd harvest it, and then the rice would grow behind it, and it's like, it's just so beautiful. Yeah, yeah and there's a whole thing around urban, um, like, um, I don't know what they call it, like ren renegade plantings, where they make use of, like, streets and kind of little areas of dirt to actually grow things in the urban situation. I mean, there's a whole thing. And it, it really connects with this kind of community building, kind of resilience, all of these themes that we've covered today. 
Um, but it's exciting stuff. I really appreciate your time, Andrew, and, and sharing what, yeah. what you're interested in working on, what you are working on, what Galois is doing. Um, it's it's seeming very, um, very exciting, and I look forward to seeing more in, in, in the future. Thank you so much for having me. No, no, thank you. All right, Ben, th- thanks, and let's keep in touch. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for listening. I do hope you enjoyed the show. I am Cody Allingham, and that was the transformation of value. If you would like to get in touch, please send me an email at hello at the transformation of value.com and I will get back to you.